Mr. President. Senator from Rhode Island. Mr. President, on the uh, day of the news reporting, the World Meteorological Organization declaring that 2016 was the hottest year ever recorded, and further declaring that the planet is now in what they call, I quote, truly uncharted territory, I rise for my 161st time to wake up speech, uh, in this case to update my colleagues on the state of our oceans. I am from the ocean state, and in January, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration released a report with the U.S. Geological Survey, the Environmental Protection Agency, researchers at Rutgers University, Columbia University, and the South Florida Water Management District. The report updates global sea level rise estimates perhaps not a big issue for Colorado, but a big issue for Rhode Island. And it made region-specific assessments for our American coastline. Based on updated peer-reviewed scientific literature, the report raised the previous upper range or extreme scenario for average global sea level in the year 2100 by an additional half a meter. NOAA and its partners then tailored their findings to the U.S. coastline based on regional variations in ocean circulation and gravitational pull and local land conditions like erosion, subsidence, and groundwater depletion, all of which affect the local impact of global sea level rise. They found that under the higher scenarios, all regions in the United States except Alaska can expect sea level rise higher than the global mean average. The news was particularly harsh for the western Gulf of Mexico and for the northeast Atlantic coast, Virginia through Maine, including my home state of Rhode Island. Our coastal managers, Rhode Island's Coastal Resources Management Council, the CRMC we call them, are taking these new estimates seriously and incorporating the high scenario into their planning. Under the new scenario, the Northeast is expected to see nine vertical feet of sea level rise by the end of the century. That means that a child born today in Providence, Rhode Island, at Women and Infants Hospital, is likely to live long enough to see this nine-foot sea level rise, vertical feet, take place along our shores. And by the way, when you go up nine feet, the shore goes back many, many hundreds of feet in many places. So in Rhode Island, what CRMC is now planning for is between 9 and 12 vertical feet of sea level rise for our state. That is going to hit Rhode Island communities pretty hard. Rhode Island's CRMC and our University of Rhode Island have developed together something called Storm Tools. It's an online research tool that projects the effects of this sea level rise and additional storm surge onto the state's coastal properties. The tool actually now needs to be updated because it currently maxes out at seven feet of sea level rise, which was the previous high scenario. Now that we've raised it to nine to 12 feet, they're gonna have to go back and redo it. But this is what it looks like based on the seven foot max. Here is seven feet of sea level rise in Newport, Rhode Island. This is the harbor. This is downtown Newport. America's Cup Avenue, which runs right through there, will be taken out. And through this area are a lot of very successful businesses that appeal to the people who come to visit historic Newport, Rhode Island. Through here, we have some of the most significant working wharves still uh, in the Newport area. And then this area here called the Point is an historic section that goes back into the 18th, in some cases, 17th century. And these buildings, of course, uh, will be flooded. There's a downtown Newport 
fire station in the middle of that as well. So it affects uh, our safety infrastructure. This is further up the bay in uh, Rhode Island. This is Barrington here. This is the town of Warren. And as you can see in the blue, there are lots of places where homes and businesses go underwater just under the seven foot scenario. Some of the stuff that goes underwater is pretty critical. Here in this bluish part is the Warren Wastewater Treatment Plant. You can't have a wastewater treatment plant that is underwater. So that's a very significant investment for Warren to have to face. And I went to the Warren uh, Town Hall not too long ago to meet with the manager and the folks who work there and hear from them about what they needed in order to uh, accommodate this new risk. Remember that the sea level rise that we're looking at here is just the floor that high tides and storms ride in on. In this simplified illustration, we can see a coastal city with sea level rise uh, encroaching on its infrastructure. Then we add to that the king tides, when celestial bodies line up so that tides are stronger than usual and therefore higher than usual. They're called king tides. That's not a scientific term, but it's the lay term for them. These tides, these king tides already push water into the streets of Miami and over the tops of the wharves of Boston on clear, sunny days, just from the tide. And if you add on top of that a strong coastal storm, our city here does not stand a chance. Homes are destroyed, businesses are ruined, damages reach the billions, and lives perhaps are lost. America's coastal communities are not prepared for this future. Part of that is because so many people are denying the prospect of this future, but also we haven't caught up. Federal Emergency Management Agency flood maps are the things that guide flood insurance for most coastal property owners. FEMA's estimates, however, fall alarmingly short, we have discovered, for coastal communities like Rhode Island's as the FEMA studies rely on outdated data and incomplete models, which means that people along America's coast relying on these models can be lulled into a false sense of comfort if their home falls outside one of FEMA's high-risk zones, but in actuality is in harm's way. So Rhode Island officials are out right now trying to educate everyone living and working along our state's coast about the flooding dangers that are fueled by climate change. It's not just state officials. Insurance and mortgage companies are starting to take these changes into account. And even the government-backed mortgage giant Freddie Mac is girding for broad housing losses from climate-driven flooding. Let me quote them. The economic losses and social disruption may happen gradually, Freddie Mac says on its website, but they're likely to be greater in total than those experienced in the housing crisis and Great Recession. Think about that. That's a pretty serious business if you're saying that the housing damage and the consequent financial harm is going to be greater than the housing crisis and Great Recession that we just lived through. Some effects of climate change may not even be insurable, Freddie Mac says. And unlike the 2008 housing crash, owners of homes that are literally underwater and not just financially underwater can have little expectation of their home's value ever recovering and therefore little incentive to keep making mortgage payments, which would in turn add to steeper losses for lenders and for insurers. This is deadly serious economic business. Shoreline counties also, although we're just 18% of the United States in land area, account for around 38% of the country's employment and 43% of our GDP. So each year, the sea and the storms 
will take a higher toll on the roads, the bridges, the seawalls, the power and wastewater treatment plants, and the military facilities that serve that economically productive shore. Despite all this, President Trump's proposed America's First Budget Blueprint zeroes out the climate change initiative globally, ends the U.S.'s contributions to international climate change programs, eliminates EPA programs that conduct climate change research and that implement the Clean Power Plan, and NOAA's coastal and marine management, research and education grants and programs, including the Sea Grant Cooperative Research Program, shifts NASA's Earth science budget, which includes its climate research, out to deep space, and cuts funding for the Department of Energy's Office of Science. Obviously, they don't like science very much. The President's proposal, if enacted, would accelerate the grim future laid out in NOAA's sea level rise report and in Rhode Island's storm tools projections. And as that grim future accelerates, it's actually science that gives us the headlights to perceive the oncoming threats. Cuts to CRMC of as much as 60% would cripple the storm tools project that provides Rhode Island our headlights. Now, the laws of thermodynamics will still govern the rise of our warming ocean waters. That's not going away. The laws of chemistry will still cause carbon dioxide to acidify seawater. That won't stop. The laws of biology will still affect vital coastal ecosystems and valuable ocean species and transmit the harm of climate change into those areas. And the laws of economics mean that this will all have a pretty bleak effect on the prosperity of Americans. All that it gains is that we'll just be blinder to what is coming at us. Now, if the President were to forego just one weekend at Mar-a-Lago, which Politico and The Washington Post estimate costs U.S. taxpayers two to three million dollars each weekend, that money from one weekend could fund Rhode Island's entire Sea Grant program for a year, helping us guide offshore energy and commercial ocean development, protecting important fishing grounds and the state's vital fishing industry. That's economic effect in Rhode Island. And when the ocean starts lapping on the stairs of Mar-a-Lago, President Trump may be hard-pressed to continue denying what all of our scientific agencies are reporting and predicting. This graphic from the Boston Globe shows at seven feet of sea level rise what's in store for the President's posh resort. The NOAA high scenario for that area actually projects for, the, for Florida's Atlantic coast sea level rise just over eight feet by the end of the century. So this image understates the flooding that is going to take place at Mar-a-Lago in this century. That just shows seven feet of sea level rise. An added foot of water not shown, plus that king tide problem that I discussed, and storm surge when you get a good wind kicking up and it blows the surface of the ocean and raises the tides further, that will all amplify these effects. Bye-bye, Mar-a-Lago. It is time that we in Congress put fossil fuel interests aside. They have had their way with us quite long enough, and it's time for us to start doing what is right by all of the Americans who live and work near the coast and will be facing this predicament in the real world. If the President and this Congress remain beholden to this shameless, polluting industry, we will lose our chance to protect ourselves. It's time that we wake up to the reality of climate change, wake up to the reality of sea level rise, wake up to the reality of ocean acidification, and start to do something about it. We can't say we weren't warned. We're just rotten with fossil fuel money and won't listen.
Mr. President, I yield the floor.